our house in Bonanza was one of the best spots on the property. It's in the middle of the jungle. You're sitting up on a hill. You have parrots flying by. And it was beautiful. It felt like a normal day to me. I had a meeting to get back to. Left. Something in me said right, and he told me to go left. And that's where it all started. We received the request for a $2 million ransom. I mean, the gun was cocked at my head. I thought it was over. Canadian Manly Guarducci grew up in the rugged mining town of Casia, British Columbia. As a young man, he soon caught the bug. Miners make good money, and it was very adventurous and a lot of risk. You're underground, it's smoky, it's dangerous. I don't know, it's just, it's the adrenaline, it's the kick of doing it. In 1997, Manley met Dion van der Wolf. Two years later, they married. He has a lot of charm. Like, he was a great guy, and he was fun. He was a lot of fun. I never liked the clean-cut kind of guys. He had long hair, and he, you know, kind of flew by the seat of his pants. It was August 1999, two months after the wedding when Manley was offered a job at a gold mine in Bonanza, Nicaragua. Despite years of civil war in the 1980s between the left-wing Sandinista government and the American-backed Contras, the Central American nation was now relatively stable. It meant a home to ourselves. It meant more stability, because the mining industry was very tough to get a job at that time. And it was a, a place where I could be home every night. Bonanza is very beautiful. We overlooked the valley and the sunset right across from our patio. It was gorgeous. The setting was amazing. It was our little paradise. Manley's boss was mining veteran and fellow Canadian, Tom McGrail, an old friend from back home. Bonanza was, in many respects, very similar to the mines that we had in Northern Canada. It was a typical mining town of about, I think, 12 or 13,000 people. And the mine provided at least 350 jobs to the uh, inhabitants. But the nicest thing is it had no snow. And it was situated on the edge of the rainforest. My day would start out going to the office for a couple hours, meeting with the shift crews, reviewing what they did, setting them off to work. And then once every two days, I would be responsible for taking a tour and visiting all the work sites, which meant traveling around the mountain and walking three to five kilometers underground, looking at all the installations. We were just coming out of the Capitan mine, which is a portal on the backside of, of the mountain. And we were to report back to the office for a meeting in that afternoon. So we just threw the belts and the hard hats in the back, jump in the pickup, and we started our drive that would probably take about 15, 20 minutes to get back to the mine. Catching a ride with Manley back to headquarters was colleague Gideon Coleman. 
I was fairly new and I asked them what was the quickest way to get back because we had to get to the, to the meeting. Which way did you need to go right or go left? Go left. Something in me said right and he told me to go left. And uh, so left we went. He knew the place better than I did. And that's where it all started. I thought many times, what would have happened if I turned right and how much easier it would have been. Returning to the Bonanza Mines headquarters, Canadian Manly Guarducci drove past one of the depots where the gold mine's explosives were stored. In the middle of the road, there were three or four people dressed in army fatigues pointing their weapons at us. I asked my partner, I said, you know, what, who are they, what's going on? He said, no worries, it's the army. And that, to me, that made sense because the army protected the explosive magazine, which was right there. We only made it about 50 yards. And then in the rear view mirror, we could see that another vehicle blocked the road behind us. One came on my side, one went on the other side. They opened up the doors, dragged us out of the truck, laid us down on the ground. I thought it was over. I mean, the gun was cocked at the back of my head. And I thought they were going to pull the trigger and, and kill me. bullets flying over our heads, and uh, I really didn't know what, what, what was going on. Around three minutes after, we were dragged up. We were lifted, and they threw us in the back of the, the pickup truck. Manley's captors weren't the army, but thieves attempting to rob the explosives cache. The soldiers guarding the cache had been outnumbered and outgunned, and one taken hostage. Manley, his colleague, and the captured soldier were bundled into two pickups along with the stolen explosives. And then they just started driving like a bat out of hell. There was a lot of yelling, a lot of screaming. You could sense just mayhem. Well, I, I was tense, very, very tense. Listening, looking, hoping it would come to an end, but what, if it doesn't come to an end, what is gonna happen? It's, you're so hyped up on adrenaline, you're just vibrating, wondering what's, what's happening next. We drove as far as the pickups could go on that road. And that's when we got out. And they told us to stand up. They tied our, our, our hands behind our back and gagged us. They started taking everything out of the trucks, ransacking the trucks to get what they could that was of any use. They lit the trucks on fire, both of the trucks. And that's when I realized that it, it, it wasn't good. In Nicaragua at the time, you always hear people talk about los armados, the rebels, the people that are in the bush with guns, robbing, stealing. You would read about them in the paper. These former Sandinista soldiers were now outlaws, 
little more than gangsters making a living through robbery and extortion. Gideon had something wrong with one of his feet. He had a, a limp. He started making a point that he would slow them down. He would say, you don't want me because I'm, I'm old and I'm slow and I'm, I'll just be holding everything up. And then they finally let him go. While mining geologist Gideon Coleman was left behind, Manley and the captured soldier Orlando Sanchez were marched into the jungle. We were told that we were going to go on a, on a long walk. And, and that's when I started getting concerned that uh, they could take it a step further and, and just kill us. It just finished raining. It rains every day at that time of the year there. So it was very difficult to walk, especially with your hands tied behind your back. And I was wearing rubber boots and shorts from coming out of the mine. That wasn't very pleasant because we're walking up steep hills in mud, clay. So with every minute that passed, I start getting a little, a little more scared, wondering what's going to happen now. I don't know. I'll have to see. Yeah. Okay, let's have a look here. Tom, Manley's been taken. Uh, listen, I'll call you back. My operations and administration manager informed me that he'd been taken, um, that we had lost two trucks, and that uh, they had also taken a soldier at that time. Just a few minutes. And although we knew of the presence of the armed groups, we had never had an incident between any of the mine employees and these groups. Initially, we had no idea what had provoked this kidnapping of Manley, nor did we actually know who was responsible for it. And so we called the police and told them what had gone on. It was a great day, beautiful, sunny day. And I was cooking because I knew Manley was on his way home. It's kind of odd and wasn't quite sure what this was all about. And uh, one of the guys, Jack, just said, well, there's no easy way to say this. Your husband's been kidnapped. And it was, um, it, it took a while. It took a while to sink in. And uh, I couldn't wrap my head around it. And they're staring at me. And I'm like, OK, this is not a joke. Who, what's going on? How do you know? Like, is this, are, are you sure? How can that happen? I remember Lois saying to me, she said, um, I think we should go down to the office and you should phone Manley's family and your family and let them know what's going on. I didn't know who to, to get mad at. I barely knew Tom. What happened to you? I just started pounding him on the chest and going, you know, how could this happen? How could this happen? It's going to be all right. We're going to do everything we can. Dion certainly was scared at that point. She was extremely concerned. She was more than upset, you know, that we, I had put her in that position. And so my job was to get him back. He tried to talk to me and calm me down and say, you know, it's OK. We're, we're going to do what we can. We'll figure this out. We're so drenched from all the rain. I was exhausted, mentally and physically. I just, just wore out. They never did untie us. And they never did take the gags off. And they just put a bunch of leaves down on the ground. And, and that's where we slept. No roof over us, nothing. And it rained. To be honest, I didn't sleep at all. It was cold, shivering, wet. And when you're going through something like that, you're not, you're not about to close your eyes and, and have a nice nap. Mm 
The first daybreak, when the sun came up, it meant hope for me. It, the night was over. It's, people started moving. You know, it just meant action, and it, I thought I was going back. I felt it. I hoped it, and, and that's that's what I wanted at that time. Marenko, hablame. Marenko, this is Tom McGrail from the mine. At the time that Manley was taken, they also took uh, two radios with them. Marenko, hablame. Marenko, this is Tom McGrail from the mine. So we uh, made efforts to communicate with him at that point successfully. Tinielas, venite aquí. Marenko, talk to me. This is Marenko. Listen, we know you have now. It became very obvious very quickly, though, that Jose Luis Marenco, in fact, was the leader of this group. Like everyone in Bonanza, Tom was aware of Marenco's reputation as Sandinista freedom fighter turned jungle-dwelling bandit. When he went in the bush, he degenerated into something extremely savage, and some of the actions of both he and his group were very savage. He made an example of, an, of a family that didn't help them, and he cut all their heads off, put them on poles on the side of the road just to make an example of this family. What kind of person does that? Not a very stable one. It was hard knowing that this guy has my husband. The tendency of this group previously was to kill a soldier. So it was extremely important to make sure that the soldier was treated no differently than Manley, and I wanted them both to be treated well. Marenko's number two was equally intimidating. He was called Tinebalis, which means darkness. There's just something about him. It was like you're looking into nothing. He just looks evil. He'd scare anybody if you looked at him. They had a quick meeting, and they told me that they had talked by radio to the mine. And that gave me more hope. I felt, well, if there's communication, then they're going to resolve this, and I'll be going home. But this was far from the case. In fact, the Nicaraguan government had by now called in the army to help track down Marenko and rescue Manly. The most important thing was to make sure that there was never a confrontation between Marenko's group and the army or the police. In the event that a confrontation were to have occurred, of course, then you would have had some kind of a, a firefight. But, you know, AK-47s going off in the jungle, a lot of things can happen. It would have placed everybody at risk. Ever since day one, it was always known that the army was going to be after us. I mean, that's something that they would say. If the army finds us, then we're going to put you in the middle and we're going to use you as protection. After two days, they untied our arms. They took the gags off, and they put pack sacks on, uh, on the soldier and I. Very heavy pack sacks. I was treated like a mule, being asked to walk fast and hard. But uh, no, it's still feeling hope. I just wanted, wanted to get out of it.
Oye, tú, mira. Apurate. Marenko told me now that he had me, he, he needed to get something out of it. He did make it clear that I would stay there as long as it, I had to until, until he got what he wanted. Quiero ver las manos. Arriba. Los quiero ver. Quiero ver las manos arriba. Arriba. Canadian gold miner Manly Guarducci had been held hostage for four days when his captors sent a message to his boss, Tom McGrail. When we received the, the request for a $2 million ransom to recover Manly, and I knew I was in trouble. I had problems rubbing together two nickels. The best I could probably do was around $80,000, which would represent the sales for one week from the mine. It would also mean that I didn't pay my employees, and it would have also brought the house down. That would have been the end of the mine, as we know. With no means to pay the ransom, Tom McGrail was locked in a deadly game of poker with the rebel leader. Marenko couldn't have picked a worse time to kidnap somebody who worked at a gold mine. Gold being at all time low, the production at the mine was not good. I knew no payment was coming from that operation. Marenko didn't believe me because, as always, the rumor is your gold mine, you have a lot of money, you sell gold, you're making millions and millions of dollars. The reality was quite otherwise. And in the event that the mine were to be shut down, the vast majority of the household leaders in Bonanza, they would have lost their source of income. And they would have also lost their potable water system because we would have disconnected the pumps and sold those. And most importantly, they would have also lost their electricity because the intent was, was to shut down the hydro plants and move them out as well. We made the information available to anybody who would want to listen. Had the community been affected by the shutdown of the mine and had we made it known that it was due to Marenko's actions, then certainly the community would have risen against Marenko rather quickly. For both Tom McGrail and Jose Marenko, the stakes were extraordinarily high. If Marenko overplayed his hand and the mine was forced to close, his self-proclaimed role as heroic rebel leader would be in tatters. If Tom misplayed his hand, Manly and Orlando the soldier would likely end up dead. Orlando knew what kind of people they were, and his concern was that a no Nicaraguan soldier has been held captive by these people and, and then let go alive. And, and yes, Orlando, as I, was very, very worried and, and scared. The thing that bothered me the most when I thought about Dion was that we just moved to Nicaragua. We have just been married. <laughs> I was worried about what she thought was happening to me. Is today the day? Is this going to be over today? And then night would come and you go, OK, maybe tomorrow. You're trying to be strong. You're trying to everybody's like, you know, it's okay. Keep your chin up. Be tough. You know, we'll get through this. And you're doing your best. You're trying not to, you know, lose it every 20 minutes of the day. You got to be strong. You got to think positive.
the usual stops of one or two days were stops just to, to heal yourself. You know, get some rest, build up your strength again. But your feet are the biggest issue because you're, you're wet the whole time. I mean, the minute you put your boots on in the morning while well, your boots are wet, but from the time you put them on all day, your feet stay wet. Keep your feet in water for about eight hours and then rub them with a cheese grater. You know, uh, you got pieces of skin coming off all over the place. It was early morning and we were in the very tall jungle triple canopy. And these raccoons were in, in the high, high trees and Marenko was just taking shots at this and he, he must have blasted about 10, 15 shots between him and a couple other guys trying to hit this family of raccoons and they, they couldn't hit it. I just looked at Marenko, I said, well, give me the, you know, let me, t let me take a turn. He thought I was nuts. He said, you know, y you know how to use a gun? I said, yeah, I hunted since I was a kid. And he says, well, I can't give you a gun. You know, you might, you might hurt one of us. And there's 10 of them with rocket launchers and, and AK-47, so... I finally managed to convince him to give me the gun. And he gave me the gun and one bullet. And that was it. And that's all it took. One shot, and we had about a 25 or 30 pound raccoon fall out of the tree, and that's what we barbecued that night. When I ate that, that's when I realized how hungry I had been. But yeah, I was famished. The stolen radio was now out of power, but despite being hidden deep in the jungle, messengers continued to travel back and forth between Bonanza and the rebels. Ten days after the kidnap, a parcel arrived at the camp. It was a, a care package. Marenko and his crew went through the package before I got it. They took whatever they felt they would like. But getting a letter from Dion, my wife, was, was probably one of the happiest moments. Dearest Manly, I pray you get this letter just to let you know that you don't need to worry about me. I love you, and I'm with you every day. Don't give up. We will be together soon. All my love always. Your wife, Dion. That's... It meant, it meant, meant the world to me, knowing that I wasn't alone in this situation because I needed to hear that, that everything was going to be okay. They sent in my boots, which were nice, my glasses, because then I could take my contacts out. One of the highlights were the, the cigarettes and the peanut butter. They sent a couple of jars of peanut butter, and that was a treat. I licked those up right away. from Marenko. Marenko rejected Tom McGrail's meager counteroffer of $80,000. 
Nonetheless, the rebel leader now halved his demand to one million dollars. Call John. I had decided certainly on behalf of the mine that the maximum that we would pay him at any time would be the 80,000. However, it would mean the end of the mine. That never changed. Generally, we would walk till almost, almost darkness. We would, we would stop just in time to light a fire and heat something up and cook something. In the evenings, the rebels met. They would talk among themselves, but loud enough for us to hear. One night, I'll never forget it, they, they were talking about how they were gonna kill us. Is it gonna, are they gonna do it? painlessly without us knowing, or are they going to torture us? For the soldier Orlando, the situation was especially dangerous. He knew more about the, the captors than I did. He also knew the consequences he was facing. And I'm sure that he probably never thought he was going to get out of that. So he, he was scared out of his mind. I, myself, the same thing. I was starting to get very anxious. I wanted to get out. I wanted to do something. And, and that's when Orlando and I talked about plan B, as I call it. And that was seeing if we could take some of these people out by force and, and escape somehow, because it, it, was, it was becoming obvious this was going to drag on and on and on. Yes. You're so desperate, you'll do anything that it takes to get out. And if it meant killing somebody, it's the right thing to do. It's the logical thing to do. The danger that the hostages would die in an army ambush remained until the government agreed to stand down the soldiers. How did that go? At the same time, an intermediary, Camilo Turcios, was recruited. Camilo and Marenko had been comrades during the Civil War. Marenko would have perceived uh, Camilo to be a person of importance. So Camilo is extremely important to us as a, as a liaison. I had just gotten this pendant from my mother-in-law from uh, our wedding. And he said, you know, I need, I need that. I need your, and I, I didn't quite understand why he needed it. Don't worry, trust me, dame lo. And then I just said, okay, if that means getting my husband back here, take it, you know, it's yours. Cuidate, vámonos. After several days' trek through the jungle, Camilo reached the rebel camp. The first time I met the messenger, Camilo, I wasn't forewarned that he was coming or not. Uh, he just showed up and sat down beside me and, and started tell, telling me who he was and that he was there to help. He made me feel real safe, he gave me a lot of hope. I looked at him as, as my savior. He was the one that was going to get me out. But he said, anything that we do is going to take time. The next day, Camilo left camp for Bonanza, taking with him a letter from Manly to Dion. Dear Dion, every time I look at your pendant, I see your eyes, and I now realize that we have to live every day at the fullest possible. I send you a kiss every day at 6 p.m. and at 5 a.m., and I hope you will receive them. I do not want you to worry. Be strong, and hopefully I'll be out of here soon. 
With all my love forever, your husband, Emily. You can't not think about him. We're in a house and we just moved in. You have no friends, you have no family. You're, you're doing your best. It was hard, it was really hard to be in this house without him. Every day you wake up thinking, when is, when is the messenger coming back? When is, when is Camilo getting here? After four or five days, I was getting more desperate because we thought we were getting out. And then it just got worse. When Marenko, Tiniebelis, and several others suddenly left camp without explanation, Manly feared negotiations had broken down. Now, only lightly guarded, he decided it was time to put Plan B into action. Me and Orlando would have to muscle our way and take one or two, one or two of them down, get a knife, which one of the guys had, and I knew where it was stashed. And then Orlando would take care of the AK, and, and once he got his hands on it, then we'd be all right. And I was really pumping Orlando up because he was tired, he was weak, and he was scared. Okay, you know, Orlando, we gotta do this. He, he was there. He said he was gonna do it. With negotiations for his release seemingly stalled, kidnapped gold miner Manly Guarducci decided his only hope was to risk escape. But his plan was thwarted when the rebels decided to move camp. Part of me was worried because now we're gonna go meet the rest of Marenko's men. Therefore, there'd be too many to execute the plan. But the other part of me was saying, hey, maybe we're gonna go meet the messenger and something good is gonna come out of all this. I noticed that we were heading back south. We were gonna go meet the other, other part of the group with Camilo. That means we were heading closer to civilization. We walked quite a ways. We walked up and over a couple of mountain ranges to get there. The go-between Camilo came to the meeting with no ransom money in hand. Only an ultimatum to Marenko from Tom McGrail. Take $80,000, watch the mine close down and the community be impoverished. Or release the hostages and save what's left of your reputation. It was about noon when they came to get me to meet Marenko and the messenger. I was a little worried. I wanted to bring Orlando, and they said, no, you can't bring Orlando. They started telling me that, that, that I was going to be released. No more here. You come in with me, we take you out of here, back to Bonanza. They said that Camilo is going to walk me out. I said, Orlando, I want to know where Orlando is. He's got to be free too. They wouldn't tell me anything about Orlando. They, did, they would not answer the questions, and they didn't tell me if he was free or not. They just ignored the subject. Yeah, go get your things and we go. Oh, yeah. What concerned me most is that Tinieblas was walking me out. And that to me made no sense because he's the guy I feared the most. I, I felt that they were taking me somewhere to kill me because I didn't have any other log logical explanation why Tinieblas would be there. It was after about an hour's walk that we came up over a ridge and there was Orlando. 
And that's when I realized that I was on my way home. It, it, I, I just felt so happy and, and glad to see him. It was three days walking to get out, but I didn't care. I mean, I did not care. I knew we were heading south. And when my feet hit the Rosita Road, bueno. Amigos. I have never felt so good in my life. Knowing that it was all behind me was incredible. I mean, uh, uh, the sense of freedom was was unreal. It didn't matter. I couldn't. My feet were sore. I didn't feel any of it. All I felt was the happiness of being there. Tom is the first person I seen. I just gave him a big hug. Uh, yeah, he could have been my father, and I knew he had a large part to, to, to do in getting me out. Oh, hey, look at me. It was a tremendous relief. Not because I had ever, had ever felt that I was not going to get him back. I just wanted to make sure I got him back in relatively good health, and that's how he came out. And there's all these people in the office, and I remember looking for him. I'm like, you know, you know, come on, like, and I walked right by him. I didn't even see him, and they're going, he's right there, he's right there. And I didn't recognize he was so skinny. Dion came in the in the office and and to just give her a big hug. She came running to me. It was the best moment ever. It's over. It's it's over. For the former Sandinista freedom fighters, the kidnapping proved to be their undoing. Despite no ransom money ever changing hands, some rebel leaders thought otherwise. Violent squabbles soon broke out. First, Camilo was mysteriously ambushed and murdered. Then, Marenko himself was killed by the army. And then, Tiniebelis by the police. In 2002, Manley and Dion returned to British Columbia. Manly still works in the mining industry, and today the couple are raising a family. Well, I'm glad to be back in, in British Columbia. It was an experience down there, and we made it through it. We're OK. But I am very glad to be back on familiar ground and close to my family. I don't see us leaving anytime soon. Yeah, the experience definitely changed me. I'm not a very emotional person. I get blamed sometimes for being very hard and not opening up and not breaking down. But I think being hard, that's part of, of getting through stuff like that. But it also makes it hard to deal with it when it's over. That's another story.